have Derek Steiner uh, to talk to us. Um, Dr. Steiner received his um, bachelor's degree from Ohio University and his PhD in astronomy from Harvard University. He was a research postdoc at Cambridge University in 2012. In the same year, he joined CSA as a Hubble fellow. His research has been focusing on studying the properties of black holes through observations. Today, he is going to talk to us about measuring the spin of stellar mass black holes. Well, uh, thank you very much. It's, it's great to be talking to you about uh, my research. In, in about a week, I'm moving down the road to MIT, so I guess this is uh, maybe a, a, a farewell head talk. I can't, I, it's so, so far away, I'm not sure I'll be able to get back here too often. Uh, no, but uh, so th this, this work measuring stellar mass black hole spins has really been uh, an exciting and new endeavor. Um, it's, this is really something that's sort of only become possible in the last sort of uh, 10 years or so that people have been taking this seriously. And, and just to remind those of you who I, I'm sure have heard this before but may have not spent a lot of time thinking about it, uh, this is really something sort of wild and fundamental. This, the the no-hair theorem tells us that a black hole is completely describable the same way that an electron or a proton, a, a fundamental particle is described by just three quantities, its mass and its spin and it's charged. However, because black holes that we study are uh, astrophysical systems that live in a plasma, uh, charge neutralizes. And so effectively, charge is unimportant, and we're left with just spinning and massive black holes, where these two parameters completely describe those objects. And uh, so that I don't spend a lot of time trying to convince you that this is something really profound and important, I'm going to uh, lean on the shoulders of someone that you may have heard of before, uh, Chandrasekhar said that in his entire scientific life, the most shattering experience was the realization that an exact solution of Einstein's equations of GR, this uh, discovered by Roy Kerr, that is a Kerr solution where a black hole is describable by just mass and spin. He said that this shattering experience, that, uh, that this solution provides the, the exact representation of untold numbers of massive black holes populating the universe, was the most shattering experience of his scientific life. Uh, that's quite a statement, and uh, so I, I want to impress upon you that this is something really important and fundamental. So the, the masses and spins of black holes, and in particular these black holes, are for me the, the name of the game. So this is a, a road map of the 25-odd stellar mass black hole systems that we know about uh, predominantly in our galaxy, for which we have dynamical information about the masses. So uh, there aren't a whole lot of systems, but you know, but this is this is this is what we have. And every year or two, another one goes off. So the population grows slowly over time. Um, but this is uh, this is really where where we're at right now. We have a couple dozen of these systems. Here you see the black hole, and you see its its companion near it. And for reference, there's the Sun and Mercury. So these are really tight binary systems um, that go into outbursts maybe once a decade. Uh, once a century, and they might be X-ray bright, accreting near their Eddington limit for about a year. Uh, so, so I'm going to return to this diagram later in the talk. I just want to show you it right now, so you are familiar with these guys. Uh, but the focus of of what I'm going to be talking about is really measuring spin. And how do we do that? Well, we can't put in a test particle and, and measure the measure its properties as it, as it's going around the black hole at a radius that we specify. Exactly. So we're, uh, it's, it's unfortunate, but we have to come up with other and more uh, clever means. Luckily, GR gives us a big uh, helping hand. In particular, in GR, around a black hole, there's a special orbit, this innermost stable circular orbit, or, or ISCO, as we shorthand it. And what's nice is this ISCO radius, uh, we, we think, is the truncation radius of uh, any accretion disk that's that's orbiting around a black hole. And in particular, this is a, a geometrically thin, optically thick accretion disk that I'm talking about. But we think these disks extend down to the ISCO, and if you were to pluck a little piece of matter at the inner edge of that disk, it would quickly, and by quickly I mean uh, uh, maybe 10 microseconds or something, plummet through the horizon and, and vanish. But while it's just outside of this ISCO, it's stable. 
And what's important about this, this inner radius is that it changes dramatically as a function of spin. In particular, if you take two identical black holes, one non-rotating, spin zero, one maximally rotating, spin one, but otherwise identical systems, the ISCO changes for a typical black hole from 90 kilometers to 15 kilometers, a factor of six difference in the ISCO radius, which turns out to produce dramatically different uh, radiation. Uh, it's uh, much, much brighter radiation and much hotter radiation uh, as, as a consequence of the inner disk moving inwards. So this Im uh, important difference, this, this relationship between the spin and the ISCO radius is really what uh, those of us in the business of measuring spin are trying to exploit. So I'm, I'm going to speak here principally about continuum fitting, uh, but uh, you know, if, if uh, Laura or Javier were up here telling you about reflection studies of spin, uh, they're using the same relationship. So this is really the, uh, the crux of our modern methods of, of measuring black hole spin. And again, this plot just shows you how if you uh, vary spin from uh, maximum or from, from non-rotating to maximum prograde or to maximum retrograde, where the disk orbits counter to the sense of the, the black hole, uh, you get a factor of uh, six or nine total variance in the inner disk radius. So the method uh, that I've focused on for most of, uh, most of my research is, is the continuum fitting method. And what's nice about this technique is that it's incredibly simple. It's something that we're all familiar with uh, because it's exactly analogous to how we all learned that one can measure the radius of a star using the property of black body radiation. So uh, we all know that if you have uh, a star which is uh, emitting like a black body and you go out, take a spectrum of that star, you can determine the temperature, you can integrate that spectrum to determine the flux, and from that flux and temperature, you've determined a solid angle on the sky. Now, if you happen to have a uh, parallax or something that tells you the distance, then from one observation, you can turn around and say, okay, well, that's, that's the radius of the star, just, just as a consequence of an emitting black body with uh, effectively determining, determining its area. Now, uh, these accretion disk systems are analogous, but, but different. Instead of a single temperature, it's a temperature profile. But nevertheless, it's, it's the same principle. We just need to determine effectively uh, a, a critical area. So instead of having a problem that's shaped like a sphere, though we have something that's shaped like a cylinder, so instead of just distance, we need to know distance and inclination to deproject uh, this effect. And then it turns out that the, the ISCO radius itself comes out in kilometers, and we're really interested in a dimensionless spin parameter. So we need to also know mass. Uh, but the, the punchline is that in a completely analogous way, if we have a, an X-ray temperature for which we can determine flux and, and uh, characteristic temperature, uh, and if we have independent knowledge of distance, inclination, and mass, we can determine the ISCO radius, determine spin. So this is the method in a nutshell. Uh, and so you have a sense of how this looks. Here's a very typical spectrum that we might use to make these sort of spin determinations. This happens to be a system called uh, H1743 minus 322, very lovely name. Uh, and here you see there's a, a very bright thermal accretion disk component, and there's also some nuisance Compton power law component. Now, Laura uh, would want to know all about this. For my purposes, I'm, I'm trying to throw this away, and I really want to know about this thermal disk. And we might have some many dozens, or uh, if we're lucky, even a couple hundred spectra uh, that, are, that are like this for any given source. But the, I guess the principal question, I think, to ask is, okay, well, this is all well and good as a setup, but, but the question is, how well does this work in practice? And I'm going to show you it works incredibly well. So uh, I'll show you for LMCX3, this wonderful system, we've been able to uh, examine the, a, a single black hole looking at it over a range of luminosities over time and with many different instruments. And the punchline is that this method works. So uh, in particular, here I'm showing you LMCX3, which is a, happens to be a persistent black hole system. Many of these are, are transient. They turn on and off. LMCX3 is always on. And it's been studied since uh, X-ray telescopes were, were flying. And here I'm showing you essentially the, the complete X-ray record up to 2010 of this system. And you're seeing many detectors with very different characteristics. We, we pulled together all the data that we could for this system, some uh, 700 plus observations. Now, uh, 
There's one wrinkle, which is that our method, in order for it to work well, has sort of a Goldilocks zone in luminosity. It's, a, it's more of a technical requirement. If you want to know more about it, feel free to ask. But let me just say for now, there's sort of an order of magnitude range in luminosity with which we restrictively uh, uh, seek to, to examine the data to determine spin. So, so if we call down to just this order of magnitude range here of luminosity, we're left with some 400 spectra. We look at what is the inner radius that you get out from these data, and we find there's something incredibly constant, constant to about 5%. So what this means is if you give me a single X-ray spectrum, I now have very solid reason to believe that I can tell you the inner radius from that, that observation to within about 5% precision. So this is a very strong validation of the continuum fitting method and in fact of sort of the, the principal basis for making uh, spin determinations as a rule. So this, this is essentially the, the, the foundation for our approach. Uh, and with that sort of bedrock is uh, hopefully laid out for you, I want to now just jump in to, to show you where we've come in the last nine, ten years of working on these systems. So this is uh, some, some, some 20 plus black holes for which we've measured the spin with continuum fitting technique or with the iron line, which is also called the reflection method. Uh, and this is showing you the, the list roughly ordered by spin. Uh, so low spins are down here, high spins up here. Um, and you'll see that nature seems to give us systems which span the full allowed range in general relativity. So this is, this is interesting. We have a number of systems with very high spin and some with essentially uh, no spin. Um, so this is, this is our, our current roadmap and I think, you know, and our hope is that in another few years maybe we'll have uh, improved the systematics on these. We'll have more comparison sources and maybe we'll have roughly doubled the sample is, is all we can, I think, uh, hope for reasonably. Uh, but I want to now highlight three of these systems for you, and, and I'll explain why in a, in a moment. But I want you to note that these three systems all have relatively high spin. Uh, 0.84 here is the, the lowest of the spins of these systems. And uh, the reason I'm highlighting them is, is returning to this diagram, this, this road map of, uh, of black holes, I want to point out to you that these three systems, and it's, it's only three, are different than the others. All of the other systems accrete via Roche lobe overflow. That is, uh, the binary companion at, at some point has uh, evolved off the main sequence. They've gone through some sort of uh, uh, phase where it's, it's tightened in, it's tidally locked, it's filling the Roche lobe and dumping matter onto the companion star. These three systems are not doing that. These three systems are being fed by powerful winds from very massive companion stars. But that's not the only thing that's different about them. These three systems are also uh, quite young, and we know they're quite young because they have a ticking time bomb right next to them that will go off in a couple million years. So the, these systems are all young. They're all, they all have very high spin, as I showed you. And it turns out the masses of these systems are also all quite high. They're, they're among the, the most massive few black holes that we know. All of them are above 10 solar masses. Most of the rest, most of the transient systems are below 10, even below 9 solar masses. So this is a hint that maybe something is different about these systems. And in fact, Tassos Fragos uh, in the last year came out with a very interesting story saying that these transient systems can, uh, can actually produce all of their spin by, by being born with, with zero spin and accreting their spin over time. These systems haven't had the time to do that. So uh, they must have been born with high spin. Is, you know, but there's, again, there's only three. So we're interested in saying, is this actually evidence of a distinct population, or is this just a small number fluke? So uh, in, the, in the quest to really address this and to try to suss this out, uh, we were very interested in looking at measuring the spin of other uh, very massive and persistent black hole systems. Uh, so we were asking ourselves, how do we, how do we test this? And here's where uh, I want to uh, introduce all of you to IC10X1. So some of you already know this, uh, this wonderful system. So uh, at the time that we proposed, IC10X1 was known to, be, uh, to have a mass greater than 30 solar masses, 
which is astounding. More than twice the mass uh, of the previous record holder, which was only 16 solar masses or so. So this thing is really a behemoth. Um, however, I should note that the gold standard in, in measuring masses for these systems is absorption line spectroscopy. And for IC10X1, there, there, there's a double whammy. It's, it happens to be always bright, which means that you don't get absorption lines in general because of X-ray heating. But then it's also in a metal poor galaxy. Uh, IC10 has a metallicity of about 0.15. So you don't, you don't have much to emit anyhow. So this was, this was very, very tricky. Uh, well, I, sh I should say you don't have much to absorb. Um, and the only way that it was possible to get a mass for the system was to, to use uh, helium lines. So this, was, uh, this mass was determined from, from, from helium line emission. Um, however, it's, uh, it's a tremendous system. It's, it's always very bright. It's around 10 to the 38 ergs per second, always. It's, rel it's in the local group, so it's nearby, not too nearby. And what's, I think, most amazing about the system is that it's eclipsing for roughly a third of its period. It's, it's, it's uh, wild. I'll show you a, a light curve in just a little bit. Um, but this is a tremendous system, and, and the reason that it's eclipsing so dramatically, it turns out, is that it has a wolf ray companion, and this thing is just uh, producing these, these huge, these copious winds. Um, so, as I said, the, the mass was determined from these helium line dynamics. Here I'm showing you that data, uh, this, this one from uh, 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 Silverman and Filipenko, where they determine the mass function uh, about eight solar masses, uh, but when you put in the knowledge of the companion star mass and everything, it, the, the strong constraint was more than 23 solar masses, most likely more than 30. So he said, this system is perfect. If this has a high spin, this is, this is completely in line with that story. There's a unique formation mechanism. Chris Kachanik has a paper exploring this uh, you know, possibility of just uh, uh, direct uh, accretion-induced collapse. This, this might tell us something profound about how black holes are formed, particularly these massive black holes being formed differently. So this was the goal, and this was, uh, and, and initially what we did was we proposed to uh, obtain an unprecedented view of this system using Chandra and its uh, amazing uh, uh, angular resolution, along with New Star, which would provide the first real high energy coverage of the system. And you need that high energy coverage to disentangle that Compton component that I showed you we were interested in actively ignoring previously. So that, that, that Compton component is, is a nuisance for us in measuring the disk. And we need to, to be able to accurately model it to get rid of it. However, uh, just within the last year, the story on IC10X1 has completely changed, and this was a really This is this is really a fascinating revelation, uh, and and I think uh, quite mysterious actually still. So here I'm showing you the phased light curve. This is this is data put together by Silas Slaycock. This is the phased light curve from all Chandra and XMM observations of IC10X1. You see this dramatic eclipse which uh, lasts for some 20, 30% of the phase. Uh, but what's wild is that it turns out that this eclipse is a quarter orbit out of phase with what was predicted from the radial velocities. So, if you, uh, so normally, you would expect this eclipse to, uh, to occur when the radial velocity is at sort of a, a minimum amplitude, when the star is just passing, when the black hole is just passing behind uh, the companion star, and, and so there shouldn't be any motion towards or away from you. But actually, it occurs when there's uh, when the lines are moving towards you at their, their maximum velocity. What is going on? This, thank you. So this is really a, a, a puzzle, and um, and trying to make sense of what was happening, uh, Silas realized that this. This was an indication that this line is not coming from the companion star, actually, but it's probably coming from the wind. And this is, I, I think, telling us that there's something funny about helium lines, and it's a wolf ray system, so we know there's this, this bright wind. But this was really, uh, really a, a big startle. And in fact, so, so upsetting to the picture of the system that it was even suggested, well, maybe this is a neutron star and not even a black hole. Uh, here's just a... I'm going to skip over the schematic showing 
uh, what this looks like, but if anyone's interested, I can come back to it in the questions. Um, so uh, as I said, we have, we have a, a beautiful Chandra light curve. We have uh, uh, also beautiful, but, but less signal uh, in, in the new star light curve of the system. You see that the eclipse in new star is both shallower uh, and narrower than in Chandra. It may be a little bit tough to pick out by eye, but it's, it's significant actually. And that's telling us something really interesting. It's telling us that uh, what's going on is there's this shielding by some sort of Compton thick wind around the core of the, the wolf ray. The core is actually relatively small, but this extended wind is producing this, this enormous eclipse. Um, and we see it the, because the high energies are much less sensitive to obscuration, we see it emerge from this pseudo eclipse sooner in, uh, in high energies which new star is sensitive to than in the Chandra bands. Um, there's a lot of uh, in interesting, uh, there's, there's a lot of things that are interesting to say about the spectra and I, I don't have time to get into it. There, we see a warm absorber component, um, but what's the punchline is that we have a very beautiful, actually very thermal spectrum from this source, which I am much more thermal than, than I think we were expecting. On this basis, we're able to conclusively rule out the possibility it's a neutron star. Uh, however, we no longer know the mass of this uh, previously record-holding black hole. And so I'm, I'm left with, uh, it's a very exciting system, but unfortunately I can't tell you the punchline that, that originally we set out to do, which is, what is the, the spin of this most massive of black holes? But I can show you this, which is, as far as we don't know the mass and in in the inclination of the system, we, I can tell you if you if you give me the the you know the knowledge of God, if you tell me what the mass and inclination is, I can I can tell you what the spin is for that give, that pair. Uh, and in fact, so we've created a map for what spin is for any given pair of those parameters, and uh, he, that's that's shown to you in these colors and uh, contours, and these white contours here show you. Uh, chi-squared contours indicating that there's a preference in the data for sort of a normal-ish range of mass and uh, a lower inclination. So uh, what this means is that if the mass is in line with the other wind-fed high mass systems then the spin is also high. It's going to be above 0 0.7, 0 0.8. But we're left not, not being able to really address that question that we had initially sought out to. But I think it's telling us that this this marvelous system with powerful winds, this dramatic eclipse, we've at least established that it's a black hole. And I think if you are interested in black hole or wolf ray systems, this is the source for you. Unfortunately, this was not the source for us in testing this original question. And we're looking for such a source now to, to fill the role that, uh, that we were hoping to do with IC10X1. I can tell you there's, a, a little, there's other interesting um, there's interesting physics that's that's also buried in the wind. We can we can test the the body accretion rate and the efficiency, and so there, there's other physics there. Uh, but I, I I've really sort of pushed my time, so I'm gonna end with a, a quick summary, telling you that we've measured about 20 black hole spins, and we have a hint, just a hint, that these high mass wind fed s systems might be something distinct. Uh, so we're trying to to probe that and suss that out. Um, unfortunately, IC10X1, while uh, sort of, a, I guess, a, a king of a black hole system in its own right, is not, uh, we, don't, we don't know if it's uh, particularly massive or not, um, and it was not, uh, it was not the test that we were hoping to establish. So we're hoping to find a wind-fed system that we can use to, to conclusively test that relationship. Uh, right now, that's sort of the status of our campaign, and I'll leave it here. Thank you. Uh, I, so I don't have a, a spectrum on, on hand to show you, but um, I think the, the profile is, is actually fairly weak. I, I, I think this might be possible, but it might take better quality data. I think it is supposed to, the, the thought is that it comes from this sort of narrow 
interface, so I'm not sure how. So how about the other windows systems, like Civic Swan is very bright. Have you tried to see if you can get the medium line from it? It's windows system, but it's not the same. Well, the, the mass loss rate in this system is something like 10 to the minus 5 solar masses per year. From, from Civic Swan, I think it's um, at least an order of magnitude less. Uh, yeah, in, in no other system, to my knowledge, do you actually have such a strong wind that you get this Compton thick core. Uh, so I, I expect it. I expect this sh should be, but it might might be just uh, damped. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. So actually, the. Um, this this here, I, I, uh, I didn't speak about it, but I divi subdivided the sort of out of the clips phase, which I cleverly called high, into two two parts. And you see that the 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 optical or the, the the density in the wind changes by about ten to the twenty two, or a few times ten to the twenty two, uh, from this side to that side. So I think you know there there is some structure there that you can probe, and, and in fact uh, the the wind is even thicker here where you expect the black holes a little bit further along your line of sight. So you see this kind of variation um, and probably... I think that's entirely possible and would be... Yeah, it, um, we don't have data that's of this quality, um, especially with the high energy coverage, uh, really spanning m much in time. There's, there's one other XMM data set for which it might be possible to look, do sort of a longitudinal study, see if there's any evidence for uh, systematic variation in the wind. I, I haven't looked at it closely enough to say. That's an interesting thought. Any other questions? Yeah, I have one more question. Yeah. Um, Do you hear that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. What is that? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for that introduction and thanks for having me here. Uh, it's a pleasure. Today I'm going to talk about planetary nebulae and their X ray emission, which a lot of people don't realize that these. Beautiful objects are actually sources of X-ray emission. Um, to give you some context about this wordy title, um, these are oops, these are planetary nebula here. Most of these are planetary nebula. There's about two in here that shouldn't be on this image, but they're really beautiful, really amazing objects. These are all not to scale. They're actually just a, an assemblage of nebula. Um, and you see morphologies of different shapes. You see some narrow-waisted morphologies. You see some bipolar lobes. And these are the questions that we've been trying to figure out for the last couple of decades is how do you get this variety of shapes in planetary nebulae? And I'm going to touch a little bit on how x-rays might have some insight into that. So to a refresher, planetary nebulae, as you may remember, are the end products of intermediate, low to intermediate mass stars. That's one to eight solar masses. In this HR diagram here, I'm showing the stellar luminosity and the temperature, the main sequence in the white dwarf cooling track, and essentially the general gist of what's happening in the red giant and asymptotic giant branch phase. At the tip of the AGB phase, you're losing tons of material. All of that material is going into the surrounding environment. Something happens here, and you make a planetary nebulae. 
but actually to get to show you the track of a planetary nebula, I actually have to bump this out. And if you look at most elementary textbooks, they don't actually bump out this temperature to these high temperatures. They actually stay about here, but planetary nebula go much hotter than what most people think they go to. And so they go on about this track. They reach up to 100,000 Kelvin, kilokelvin, sometimes 200 kilokelvin. <clears throat> and they go on this track and they evolve through here. I want to, if you take home anything from this slide, it's to take home that the central stars of planetary nebulae are not white dwarfs yet. They're still, they still have a lot of material on them. They have atmospheres, really thin atmospheres, but they're doing crazy things in their very high temperature. So somewhere here, something happens, and we don't know what it is exactly. It's called the post-AGB phase, or the pre-planetary nebula phase, and it's where the star is essentially enshrouded in dust, and so it's hard to see what's happening inside there. But what we think happens is a fast wind is launched during this part of the diagram. That fast wind sweeps up that AGB material, and it sweeps it into the planetary nebula shell. That's actually exposing the core, which is hot, and the central star moves across the HR diagram in this way. When it gets to a certain temperature, it can ionize that shell that it's swept up, and that gives rise to the proper planetary nebulae. <clears throat> like you see here. This planetary nebula is indicative of all of the problems that we're trying to find and solve, is how do you get this dazzling array of shapes, structures, and morphology? This is a Hubble Space Telescope image, by the way. And you also see in scattered light shells of what looks like spherically symmetric mass loss. So there is some transition to go from that to this, and we don't know what that transition is. Uh, these mass tracks, I've drawn one, but now this is for multiple. The higher mass you are, the more luminous you get, and the faster you evolve across this part of the diagram and to higher temperatures. The lower mass tracks go about like here. They don't reach as high temperatures, and they don't reach as luminous uh, central star luminosities. So this is what Hubble sees, the Cat's Eye Nebula, famous. I'm sure you've all seen this, and this is what Chandra sees. And you can only do this with the superior resolution that you get from Chandra. You can see extended emission coming from that hot bubble that's formed whenever the planetary nebula forms. And you can see a really clear, distinct, bright spot in the middle. This is a composite view. I'll blink between these two for a little bit just to show you where the X-ray emission is with respect to the optical emission. It's filling this cavity in here with X-ray emission exactly as you expect for the interacting stellar winds that we think form these planetary nebulae. <clears throat> so these two types of X-ray emission are effectively diffuse X-ray emission and these point sources. These point sources are interesting because they don't quite behave like we expect, and I'll get into that more in a little bit. The diffuse X-ray emission, like I said, is exactly what we expect from, expect from interacting stellar winds. The main problem, though, is that the hot temperatures of these, the plasma temperatures of these extended sources, are about two orders of magnitude too low from what we expect them to be, given the wind speed of the central star. And the compact X-ray emission has a pretty much unknown origin that I'm going to touch on as I go through my talk. So we put together all of these observations from the archive, and then we propose to do more observations with Chandra in cycle 12 and cycles 14. And we built up what we call the Chandra Planetary Nebula Survey, also known as Chan Plans. And it's a, we're trying to do a volume limited survey, so we're trying to get all the targets that are within 1.5 kpc. We are also using, like I said, a bunch of different observations from different cycles, and we have about 74 planetary nebula currently in our entire sample. And as I'll show you, so this is all the planetary nebula that we know about within our solar neighborhood, shown here from uh, this catalog from Fru, David Fru, who uses this surface brightness radius relationship to get pretty good dis distances to these planetary nebula. It's been notoriously hard to get distances for planetary nebula. So without that catalog, we couldn't actually make this volume. Um, his survey is complete to about 1.75 kpc. The targets that we're looking at are the black points. We can break them up further <clears throat> to show you what we're actually looking at. So here, 
On this axis, I plotted the log of the physical radius. Since we know the distance, we can measure their radii. We can then turn that into a physical radius. And we have their distance here. And we're fairly complete here. We have targeted all of these small nearby planetary nebulae. We don't have these, obviously. And we don't have any beyond this bound that we've set, 1.5 kpc. So now I've gotten rid of all of the planetary nebula, and these are just our sample. And I'm going to show you the detections that we have from our sample. So I said we have two types of planetary nebula, X-ray emission. We have these extended sources, and we have these point sources. This is what the hot bubbles look like. These are the extended sources that I showed you in red. And the histograms are on the side to show you how they relate to the rest of the sample. You see that the hot bubbles are typically the compact nebulae. The size of the nebula is proportional to the age of the nebula. So it starts small and it grows over time. So the young planetary nebula are those that emit x-rays in extended sources, as extended sources, as hot bubbles. The point sources are a different group entirely. They're these large and nearby objects. And then you get a sprinkle here of some of these more compact objects that have these bright point sources. Again, you can only separate these with Chandra. So if you looked at an XMM, you might not see that there was a point source there. And then we have these composite sources, which NGC, uh, the Cat's Eye Nebula is one of those composite sources, one of those sources that has both extended and a point source in the middle. And those are about here. <clears throat> Altogether, this is what our survey looks like. This is what our detections from our survey look like. You can see that, like I said, the young planetary nebula emit extended X-ray emission. And then the older ones, they have these point sources. But we can look at this in a different way, a more illustrative way, if we put this back onto the HR diagram. Here I have the, temp the luminosity, and here I have the temperature of the central star. Remember, the tip of the AGB is somewhere over here, and the white dwarf cooling track is somewhere on the ground down there. And what you see is that most of our non-detections are coming from this very late, highly evolved state of these central stars. When their winds have died down and when their luminosity has decreased. And most of our detections are coming from these higher states. The Helix Nebula is one of these that I'll call your attention to in a moment. But first, I'm going to walk through this diagram here. This plane is the column density. So this is determined actually from the measurement of the nebula. So you look at the, the Balmer decrement in the nebula, and you can get out the foreground extinction between us and, and the nebula. Down here is the median energy of our photons. So we have very few counts. I forgot to mention that. These are very faint sources. And so it's hard to get really good spectral analysis of these sources. Only for a few can we do really good spectra. So we have to resort to these means. Nebular, this is measured from the nebula. This is measured from the X-ray observation. These are optically thin thermoplasmas for different log Ts. So that's 10, uh, 10, 1 mega Kelvin, 10 mega Kelvin. And they behave like this. There's a lot of variation here. This is where these, these plasmas are very sensitive to what the actual extinction is, because the soft photons get absorbed by the, X, by the intervening medium. This is where the hot bubbles, oops, this is where the hot bubbles lie on this diagram. So it's pretty much consistent with about three mega Kelvin plasmas, which is what we find when we can fit the spectra. We find a pretty consistent three mega Kelvin plasma, which is two orders of magnitude too low from what we expect. There are a few really high sources, and I'll call your attention to those later in a bit. Like I said, you can measure the winds of the central stars, and there's a typical range, which is about 1,000 to 3,000 kilometers per second. And if it was a strong shock, it should follow this black line. And so the temperature should be really high for some of these central stars. But they're not. Like I said, they're all about 3 mega Kelvin. This is results from Ruiz et al. in 2003, where they're actually, they actually in, in, did a one-dimensional model that included heat conduction between the hot bubble interface and the nebular plasma. These are two plasmas, ones that tend to the six, ones that tend to the seven, ones that tend to the four. And that interface, there should be some 
heat conduction across that interface and they've made a model to account for that. And when you have that interface, what you find is that those, that cooler material in the plasma starts to combine and ev evaporate into the hot bubble. And that lowers the temperature of the hot bubble and raises the density of the hot bubble as well. And as a result, you get exactly the X-ray emitting properties that we see in these hot bubbles. <clears throat> Here's a sample of nebula that are included with their uh, heat conduction tracks. This is one of the only ways to explain this. Another way to explain these lower temperatures is if you actually look at the, an evolution of this fast wind velocity. So you start off maybe at a lower velocity, and if you're blowing a lower velocity wind and you form your planetary nebula then, then your planetary nebula can have a lower temperature. And those are the two paradigms that we're trying to figure out the, the truth, the, the, the we're trying to verify which of these two models is actually responsible for these lower than expected temperatures. <clears throat> this is another plot just showing you that the bubble radius, these models you can then extend and extrapolate and measure uh, properties of the temperature as they evolve with the size of the bubble. And our observations are also consistent with that. We also have an idea of what the X-ray emission from those hot bubbles should behave like across the evolution on the temperature scale. So these are evolving this way. <clears throat> so that's something that we've learned from the hot bubbles. What we've learned from the compact cores is completely different than what I want to focus on. So these are the hot cores that we've measured. These are the point sources in the middle. So they're absolutely point sources. They're unresolved at Chandra resolution, but they're coming from the central star. And again, you see a bunch of things that are consistent with plasmas. So it's all thermal emission. As far as we can tell, we're looking at thermal emission. I've coded these in different colors and shapes to give you an idea of the different variety of central stars that are present in planetary nebula. You have binary central stars, which are the diamonds. Uh, wolf rayet central stars. These are not wolf rayet stars in the traditional sense. These are called bracket wolf rayet stars. They're a lower, a lower mass version of of wolf rayet stars, meaning they have emission lines present in the central stars. And then we have others which are just normal run-of-the-mill central stars coded in green circles. <clears throat> so you can see that the binaries are doing something different, doing something weird. They're harder than these other sources. And this hardness, if you look at a few of these, you'll see that these Binary central stars are usually in really compact binaries with periods less than a day. And it's hard to get a period so short unless you've gone through some form of common envelope evolution. And that's what we think is happening in these stars. We think that the x-rays that we're seeing here, these hard x-rays, are not coming from the central star but coming from the companion. And that companion has been spun up through its common envelope evolution, ejecting that common envelope and surviving as a close binary in a tight orbit. <clears throat> These other sources are a different story. We think here we're seeing the influence of essentially self-shocking winds, similar to what they found when they looked at O stars in ROSAT, and they found that they emitted X-rays surprisingly. So we think maybe these sources are powered by these strong winds coming from these central stars, and these strong winds are variable, and we know they're variable. We can track them and fuse and the UV, and we think that that variability is causing shocks to combine and pile up just around the star, and that's maybe what we're seeing in these objects. <clears throat> that's all, that also ties in with this picture, which is that most of these are happening at the high luminosity phase where the winds are still very strong and still very powerful and, and variable. Uh, this star here is the Helix Nebula, and it's one of these down here. It doesn't have a very strong wind, and so it's kind of an exception to the rule, but it's also our strongest source for X-ray emission. This is what the X-ray emission from the helix central star looks like. This is what you expect from the temperature of the star. Given the temperature of the star, that's what you want to see, this gray shaded line. But this is actually what we observe. And this is a, corresponds to about a 10 megakelvin plasma. And we don't know how to explain it. We've searched for a binary companion in that star, and we can't find it. We've searched for evidence of accretion in that star. We can't find it. We don't know where this X-ray emission is coming from. And so it remains unknown. <clears throat> I'll show another pretty picture. 
This is the formerly known as the Eskimo Nebula, but it's, I like to call it NGC 2392. Um, <clears throat> it has an interesting scenario. It's got this nice inner bubble, and then it's got this extended halo or extended uh, nebular shell that you can see, and then the point source in the middle. This is the optical H um, Hubble Space Telescope image. I've put the x-rays here. And you can see the x-rays are confined to that bubble again, just to reinforce this point that these are, are hot gases confined within that nebular shell. And this is just the x-ray observation. And you can do a cool thing with this. You can actually, with the resolution of Chandra, you can separate the components of this x-ray emission. So what, that's what I've done here. These are different energy bands, 0 0.15 to 0 0.3, 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to the highest band that planetary nebula emit in, which goes up to 3 keV. They don't emit any photons beyond that. Uh, so when I say hard, don't laugh. I don't mean hard, hard. I mean hard, relatively speaking. Um, <clears throat> and we're looking at, in each of these cells, we're looking at a compact region inside. And what you can see is that as you move to higher energies, at this point, the nebular emission is dominating this little square. And at this point, we're looking mostly at just a compact SAR. And it's a very high energy source. We can actually use this information to help us fit the spectra better. And we can actually get an estimate for the nebular con contribution and the central star contribution. And then we can separate those and actually get the properties of this object. And when we do that, it's this guy here which is one of the hardest X-ray sources coming from a planetary nebulae. And the temperature of the plasma of that is about 40 megakelvin. And we have no idea how to get such a high temperature in these objects unless you have a binary or an accretion disk. And curiously, the Eskimo Nebula is a really strange object in that it looks like a nice circular planetary nebula. But in fact, it's a bipolar planetary nebula that we're looking pole on into. And so it's a really strong case that there's a binary there and you're never going to see a signal from it because it's orbiting in the plane that you're looking into. And so this may be the only evidence for binarity from that particular star. <clears throat> Altogether, this is what we have so far. How much time do we have? Oh, enough? Okay, good. <clears throat> and now I'm going to call your attention to some new work that I've been doing, which is this guy right here, NGC 7027. And this is a new observation I got in cycle 15, I believe. And this is what the X-ray emission looks like, superimposed onto the eight, into the H-alpha HST observation. And I have three energy bands represented, the full band here, the soft band, and a hard band. This is actually 1.0 to 3.0. Sorry, this is an error. Um, and you can see that the X-ray emission morphology corresponds pretty closely with the optical morphology. And the soft band is doing something funny. Looks like a different source of X-ray emission. And then the hard band looks like it's more symmetric. And so a lot of people in the literature have reported that different temperatures for the plasma of this object. This object is interesting because we think it's a high mass progenitor, so it flies across the HR diagram, makes its planetary nebula very fast, and that change in morphology is present. You can see these protrusions. You can see all kinds of structure in this nebula that we don't see in a lot of others because they're not so dynamic and they're not so rapidly changing. And this has spurred a lot of, of simulations and studies into how you could actually form these from maybe a precessing jet, maybe from collimated outflows coming from some collimation process. And the X-ray emission also suggests that maybe there's two processes happening. But if you look carefully at the object, you can actually find maps of the extinction across the face of the nebula. So the nebula itself, you can get a metric using the H beta emission and using a radio continuum. Those two have the same density dependence, and so you can scale them, and they should be the same. And if they're not, then there's some extinction. And that's how this map was created in contours there. And across this nebula, you have extinction going from about half a magnitude to 1.5 magnitudes. And if you overlay this onto the X-ray emission, you see in, that the soft X-ray emission is entirely essentially defined by this extinction. So there might be soft X-ray emission all coming from this area, but we won't see it because it's being extincted. <clears throat> and that has a profound effect on the spectra and when you try to fit the spectra. 
Because if you don't include this and you include emission, you get these degenerate solutions that go that want to oscillate between a low temperature plasma like we know and a higher temperature plasma like a lot of people have reported in the literature. <clears throat> but if you separate those two, those two regions of high and low extinction, and you get rid of the iron from your model, and you fit this spectra, you get a very consistent solution that reproduces this variation and extinction across the nebula. And it kind of casts doubt on the possibility that this has a really high energetic weight and, and collimated flows, and that this is just another hot bubble, and that hot bubble is not really strongly influencing the dynamics of the nebula. So these are all the sources that I've talked about so far. There's one source that I have not mentioned, and it's the only source on here that behaves like we expect a central star of a planetary nebula to behave. So if you had a black body distribution on this plot, it would just be a series of line, lines running up and down here. And this central star is the central star of M27, or the Dumbbell Nebula, and it's the only object that behaves like X, from, in X-rays like we think it should. And it's curious, none of the photons from it are above 0.3 keV. They're all softer than that. They're all in a part of the, of the, uh, the energy spectrum that Chandra calibration is little, quite uncertain. And so we're using that, and what I'm doing here with Philip Cargow is using that to try to pin down an uh, iterative process between the calibration and the central star to see if we have the calibration right and if we can actually infer the correct X-ray spectrum using this guy right there. <clears throat> so I'll summarize our CHAM plan's res results here. We have a pretty good detection rate of about 50 to 60% across all our nebulae. We're hitting that the detection threshold where we're, we can't go too far because these sources are pretty faint. And we, if we go to the bigger objects, then we start picking up fewer and fewer exciting objects and more point sources and non-detections. So we may be complete to a certain extent now. And we may be transitioning now into studying individual objects in more depth to get, extract more information from their X-ray emission. Uh, about 30% of our sources have hot bubble detections. And again, these are the youngest planetary nebula, the most compact planetary nebula. And then we have about 40% 40 40 of our sources that are these central star emitters. And if amongst the binary, there's a more significant fraction that are emitting X-ray emission. And they tend to be these harder sources. And then we measure the LX and L bowls for a lot of these, and we find that their LX and L bowls are similar to what we would expect from shocking winds. And so we think there's two processes happening in these central stars. Binarity, and so the emissions coming from the companion, and self-shocking winds, and so the emissions coming from the central star colliding with its own wind and making shocks. <clears throat> now I'm going to take a step back to tell you about what we've been doing in addition to this. We've been expanding our survey into infrared studies. And I'm just going to briefly show you some, a list of the things that we're targeting and doing. So this is Chandra's view again. This is Hubble's. This is Spitzer's view. You can't see much, but it's because it's infrared, so it's hard to focus those photons. But if you step back from Spitzer, you actually see a lot of material even further out there. And if you, deep, if you do a deep image in H-alpha, you actually see this whole area is filled with low ionized gas. So this, these planetary nebula are really multi-wavelength objects. You can't study them in just one wavelength. You have to study them across the wavelengths to actually piece together the entire radiative processes that are happening inside of these objects. And that's what we're trying to do now. We're building upon our Chan Plans observations and our Chan Plans surveys and our Chan Plans group to build surveys in different wavelengths. We've done a program with Hersho. It was one of the largest Hersho projects awarded. Uh, with Toshio Ueta in, in charge of it. And we've been looking at the interplay between the X-ray emission and the uh, IR emission, trying to find out if the X-ray is influencing in any way the ionization of the shells further out, because these X-ray photons can penetrate further out and shake things up out there. Uh, we're also trying to get a radio survey off the ground where we're using, trying to use ALMA and other uh, interferometers to look at really close down inside of these central stars to see if we can find any information of, a, of any kind of accreting disk or something that might explain the X-ray emission. <clears throat> and then we're expanding into optical 
And I'm doing other things, which if you're here tomorrow, you should come to the ICT luncheon, and I'll show you something about how I'm using uh, UV and X-ray observations of AGB stars to try to figure out what's happening to drive those really momentous winds to see if there's any influence coming from um, coronal emission or chromospheric emission from these stars. And with that, I will say thank you and take questions. including that trend, that time scale, I'm not sure if we're actually con con including like a non-equilibrium <laughs> model or, or you, you mean just... Uh, uh, well, the Coulomb collision is bringing the temperatures of the protons and the electrons together because they start off much, much different. I think the densities in these nebulae may be l too small for that to happen. So the electron, the electron densities are like 100 per cubic centimeter, and in supernova remnants, they're a lot higher, so th that interaction might happen more frequently. So the, the sh short answer to your question is no, they're not included, uh, and I don't know if they're important because of the densities that we're talking about in these objects. Any idea how many planetary nebula were carbon AGB stars as opposed to M AGB stars? Is there any way to know? The only way to know that would be to look at the molecular envelopes that surround these really far away. And we don't have a complete survey of those to, to look at the isotopic ratios and see which ones may, be more, uh, what may have been carbon AGB stars. We do have some wolf, these wolf ray carbon stars as central stars, and where that carbon is coming from is different than the AGB process. We haven't been able to, we don't have the counts to do a high enough uh, sampled light curve to actually look for that. There is some evidence in the helix central star that there is some slight modulation, uh, but it's, it hasn't been easy to do it for all the others. So then is it true that there, there's some fraction of, Dwarf, I guess, dwarf stars floating around in the galaxy whose planetary nebula are completely invisible. The, the, the central uh, uh, hot white dwarf is completely cooled off, um, yet they are X ray active because they've been spun up in this, uh, in this uh, vast transfer. Yeah, the, the time scale for that time, I haven't looked at the time scale for the spin up and how long it would last. But there should be uh, some of these objects, and that's something that I've been actually looking into with a colleague. We're trying to find a sample of these, kind of as the endpoints of what we expect our planetary nebula to be, to see if we can actually map how much angular momentum is actually transferred and lost, and using that as the endpoint and using the beginning of our evolution as the starting point. But we don't have that sample yet, but they should be out there. Rudy will be here tomorrow and the day after tomorrow too. So if you are interested in his research, please come to talk to him. Thank you. Thank you.